Hello and welcome to Imaginations Church Online. We're so glad that you would welcome us today into your living room and uh, we're glad to be with you today. And I pray that today that you will be touched by the power of God wherever you are. What a blessing it is to join together at this time. And we have an amazing service planned for you today. We've got some powerful worship that our team has put together. I don't know, these last few weeks it's just seemed to have gone to a new level and today is no different. We've got a greeting from Pastor Chris. Craig and Melissa Ma, our location pastors at In Church Melbourne. Uh, we've got a great giving testimony as well. And then pa- uh, Dr. Robbie Sonderegger is going to preach to us today. And I know you'll be blessed. I know you'll be encouraged. I know you'll be lifted up. And so I want to encourage you today. Don't just sit back and watch church. Why not lean in today? You know, David said, I was glad when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. And while we can't come into the house, I was glad when I tuned into the online stream. And you know, it's great to be able to join together for church. And why not do something different today? Don't just sit down when worship's on. Why not stand, lift your hands, lean in with everything you've got, lean into the preaching. You know, preach, shout the preacher down from home, shout amen. But also I want to encourage you, join us in the comments as well. Engage there. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to pray for you. Uh, If there's any needs or challenges you're facing at the moment, why not connect with us online through our website, uh, send in prayer requests and praise reports. And also why not share this service today with friends, with family? It's never been easier to invite someone to church. So let's lean in church. Let's give it all we've got today and let's worship Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that we could join together as one at this one time with one heart to see you glorified. And I pray that your presence would be with each and every one of us. Lord, your spirit is in each of our hearts. And I pray that you'd move, Lord, upon those who are sick, I pray for healing. Lord, upon those who are weighed down with with, uh, worry and fear and anxiety, I pray that they would be encouraged and blessed and lifted up. Lord, for those who do not know you, who are walking in fear and darkness, Lord, I pray that today, you'd open their eyes and they'd see the light. Jesus, we love you. We glorify you in your wonderful name. Amen. Let's worship together, church.
song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me oh, we sing word worthy of every song we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever bring We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one Have we made this our declaration today? I will build my life. And I will build my life upon your home. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you.
Good morning, church. It's so good to be with you this morning. We're obviously the the Melbourne pastors, but we've had a great week here in Sydney. And this morning we've gotten to be live to you from Sydney, which has Come been on, so good. So good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you know we've been doing church at home for quite a few weeks now? I think we're at two months now. And something I've noticed is there's two ways you can do it. You can sit in your chair and you can watch church. Yeah. You can sit like you'd watch a movie, lie back, be comfort, comfortable, and that's kind of cool. But there's a change when you make a choice to not just watch church, but participate. Come on in church. now. To, to actually not be phased by the fact that it's on screen, but to understand that the power of God can move even when you're at home having home church. So I encourage you today, press into him. Don't be limited yeah. by the surroundings, but be expectant of what God is going to do. You know, it's also been a really troubling week this week on the yes. news, hasn't it? Oh, my heart breaks for what's going on around the world. This is beyond COVID. This is a whole new season. But I also know that God is on the throne and God's love is real. And I know, Craig, you've got a scripture yeah. for us this morning. Yeah. Mm. yeah good morning, church. I, I just uh, felt the Lord lay this scripture on my heart that I want to share with you. It's from Galatians 3, a reading from verse 23. But it says this, Before the coming of this faith... We were held in custody under the law, locked up until that the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ, you are all children of God through faith for all who were baptised into Christ, have clothed themselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You know, in Christ, we there's a, there's a level playing field. There's not one race better than another race, one gender better than another gender, uh, one, one tribe better than another tribe, one culture better than another culture, because we're, the Bible tells us we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But the good news of Jesus is that anyone who would come to him, anyone who would reach out to him, we can be forgiven and we can be set free. And we are, as Pastor Jack said uh, in his uh, post earlier this week, we've come from one blood, that blood of Christ that covers those multitude of sins. And so this morning, I just really felt that we need to pray for peace in our world. We need to pray that people would find their identity in Him. And so let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank You and we praise You that we are justified by faith in you. There's not one person better than another person. But Lord, we all are called to come humbly before you, to lay down our pride and Lord, to recognize that you are Lord and you are King and you are Saviour. Lord Jesus, I pray for any today who feel threatened, who feel oppressed. Lord, I thank you that in you we can find peace and reconciliation. Father, I pray today that, Lord, those who do not know you would come to know you. And Father, I pray today that those who, Lord, are in fear would find the peace of God and the promise of God. Lord, today I'm asking right now for your Holy Spirit to minister to each person in their lounge room or wherever they're watching. I'm praying right now for your presence to come. Lord Jesus, one touch, one word from you, and everything changes. And so, Lord, we praise you and we honour you. And we say, come, come, Holy Spirit, do what you desire to do. And we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Awesome. Yeah. Hey, God bless. Yeah. We're going to go to... Inchurch.com.au is the place to go to be involved with Imaginations Church. Through our website, you can connect by live streaming all services, submit prayer requests, give online, and keep up to date with events. You can also update your personal information so you can receive emails and text messages. 
why is generosity important to me and my family? I think uh, as Christians, we have a responsibility to look after, um, look after others. Um, I think where God's blessed us, we have a responsibility to bless others, and, and that only happens through a spirit of generosity. For my family, I think um, I always want to have children that are givers. I want my children to be blessed, but equally I want them to be known as blessers. Christ's example in my life and how it influences my choice and commitment to being generous, it's pretty straightforward in that he gave everything for me and my family. Um, and so I want to be like him every day. I want to be more like him in everything that I do. And he was generous, not just in giving of his life, but he gave his time to people. He um, made time for those who were the minority uh, and those who were seen as outcasts. Yeah, he was generous in everything and I want to be generous in everything that I do as well. I want to be generous with what I give I want to be generous in the time that I give to people. Um, I want to be generous in the time that I give to my kids. I think that's that's the key thing. It's like Christ, Christ gave his life in a commitment to us. It's the least that we could do um, to have to make that that commitment of generosity to others and to the church and to give back. What price can you pay back for a whole life that's been saved as well? You can't, so you do what you can instead. Yeah. Thank you, Lockie and Christina. We just love and appreciate you, and thank you for those words, encouraging us, of course, to always be generous. We who are the recipients of God's amazing generosity, his gifts and his giving, may we also continue to be generous and, and to give. Thank you, church, for your generosity, uh, especially during this season. Uh, we are so grateful for all that you're doing. And how cool to have Craig and Melissa with us right here this morning live in Sydney. They kind of walked into the auditorium and looked around and said, oh, this is strange because there's nobody here. But as we look into this camera, we know that everybody is there. And I love the uh, encouragement Melissa just gave us. Obviously, you can lay in bed right now and eat your cornflakes and enjoy church. Fine. But there might be another level if we stand together and lean in together and receive together all the things that God has for us. Well, I am really excited that Dr. Robbie is going to be sharing the word this morning. He's such a friend of our church, such a brilliant communicator, and of course, a, a clinical psychologist. He's a gift to the body of Christ. He's been a friend of Imaginations Church for many, many years. So Rosie's going to lead us right now into one of my favorite songs of all that we are surrounded we are surrounded by, by him, the Lord. And then Dr. Robbie's going to bring the word to us. So again, if you can, why don't you just lean in right now to what's about to happen.
Well, hi, Imaginations Church. Dr. Robbie Sonderegger here. I'm super honored to be bringing the word to you today. Now, of course, I would much prefer to be with you in person, but unfortunately, the planes just aren't yet flying. So I am going to be flying off the handle, hopefully today, bringing a message that I believe the Holy Spirit has inspired, a revelationary message, if you will. And uh, I hope that it's going to really bless you. Wherever you might be tuning in from, perhaps you're still in your PJs, tuning in from bed, or maybe in your living room as you've been gathering together with other people, uh, enjoying the amazing worship. How good was the worship today? Outstanding. It's so good that we get to come together, even if it's in twos and threes, and praise God. And maybe you're tuning in from the park or from your neighbor's house or from the beach, wherever you might be tuning in from today. I really hope and pray that you're blessed. So why don't we pray and then we'll get underway. 
Father God, I just thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be like the early church, gathering in, in just small groups of people. But wherever two or three are gathered in your name, you are right here with us. And I thank you so much that you want to share a word today that's going to stimulate our heart and our mind to have a deeper revelation of your goodness. And so I pray, God, that you would speak through me today. I pray, God, that you would use me as an empty vessel, pour through me, speak through me. But on the receiving end, may you open up ears and hearts and minds to truly receive the message that you want to deliver today. And may you be glorified. Have your way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about wisdom. Uh, one of my all-time favorite proverbs says that it is by wisdom that a house is built. Now, whether that house be our family house or the church house or your business house, we need wisdom. But how do we get wisdom? Well, the Bible says if any of you lack wisdom, we'll ask for it and God will give it freely. Well, that's amazing. That's such an encouraging promise. But all too often, the way in which God gives us that wisdom is, of course, through life experience. When we go through experiences, we develop a sense of knowledge. We know things better. And if we actually take this knowledge and seem to process it, in other words, understand this knowledge, and then if we take our understanding and apply our understanding, that's how we end up with wisdom. In fact, that's what the proverb says. It is by wisdom that a house is built. Through understanding, its foundations are established. And with knowledge, we discover its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasure. But when it comes to knowledge, sometimes we can know what the Bible says. We've read the stories a thousand times, but do we really understand what it says? So in order to tap into wisdom today, I'd like to really emphasize the difference between knowing and understanding. One of my all-time favorite Bible characters, if this was a pop quiz and you said, hey, what's your favorite Bible character? Well, chances are the number one that would come out of my mouth would be Eve. Now, Eve is such a heroine. She is such an amazing girl because, well, she'd never had a blueprint for having a child before. So, so, so one day, no doubt, you know, Adam would have come along and said, Eve, like, you, you got to lay off the beer and chips a little bit. You're getting a bit of a pot belly, having no idea that, well, she was pregnant. But I guess they would have looked around at the you know, animals in their environment and figured out that just like they do on the Discovery Channel, that maybe, just maybe, Eve was pregnant. But of course, when she gave birth, uh, that would have been a really challenging experience for them because if they looked around at the animal kingdom as their reference point, well, when the cow or the giraffe or the, the, the sheep is born, well, they stand to their feet. And then they immediately, you know, ma or moo, like they speak in, in the, the animal language. And so when, when the first child was born, Adam must have said, all right, get up. But it wouldn't get up, so it must have helped it up, stood it up on its feet, and it just fell back down again. He must have thought, what's wrong with my child? Well, at least say something. And the child would just scream and cry and make this awful noise. Adam must have turned to Eve and said, I think, I think we must have got a broken one. In other words, they had no reference point for bringing a child into the world, and yet God entrusted them with the future of humanity. And it is indeed the story of Adam and Eve that I'd like to kick us off with today. Um, they were in the garden, naked and without shame. But it's important to understand that distinction had not yet entered the world. And, and by that I mean, well, they had not yet eaten of the tree of the knowledge of both good and evil. And as such, all they knew was good. And so they wouldn't have known what it was to be clothed, let alone what it was to experience shame, because shame had not yet entered the world. In Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 15, it says, And the Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, You are free to eat of any tree in the garden. But 
In verse 17, it goes on to say, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of both good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. Now, there's a couple of things to point out right from the get-go. Once again, we just talked about distinction. So when God said to Adam, when you eat this of this tree, well, you'll die. But because death and disease had not yet entered the world, well, Adam wouldn't have known what death was. I mean, have you ever actually stopped to, to think about that? Like, it might as well have been good for God to say, hey, Adam, you must not eat of this tree, for when you do, you will balaba. And Adam would have said, balaba? Like, what does that mean? Okay, sure, got it. Not really, but whatever. Uh, moving right along, you see, he wouldn't have known what balaba was any more than what death was because there was no distinction. The second thing to point out is that they were given permission to eat of any of the trees in the garden. But when you eat of this tree, you'll die. Please note, God did not say, if you eat of this tree, you'll die. Rather, let me read it. But you must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat it, that'll be the day that you die. It's amazing that God knew in advance that they would make that mistake. How is it possible that despite knowing that humanity would betray God or disobey God, that God continued to love them anyway? In fact, it's my intention to point out in this particular service that not only did God know about it and God continue to love them and look after them and care for them, but that he instituted a rescue plan right from the get-go. But you know how this story goes. Picking it up in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent, who was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made, he said to the woman, did God... God really say that you must not eat of any of the tree in the trees in the garden? It's almost like that guy from the Lord of the Rings, kind of, you know, like it's, it's my precious. Did God really say that you must not eat of any of the trees in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, oh no, like we're allowed to eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say we're not allowed to eat the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden. In fact, we're not allowed to even touch it or we'll die. Now, once again, there's a couple of things to point out. As we dig deeper than just knowing what it says, let's seek to understand what's being said between the lines. The first thing, of course, is that it's a little bit weird that Eve is talking to a snake. Like I know that in this time of lockdown where we've been, you know, isolated and living in and out of each other's pockets in our own homes, that sometimes we might end up talking to the, not just the dog, but the walls or the plants. In fact, I even heard a German psychiatrist just recently say, if you find yourself talking to the walls, it is okay, you are completely normal. But when the walls start talking back to you, that's when you've got problems. And here, that's exactly what's going on. It's not just Eve chatting with the snake. The snake is talking back to Eve. And listen to what they're actually saying. The snake exaggerates the truth. So, Eve, you're not allowed to eat of any of the trees in the garden. And exaggerates the truth because he knew it was just one tree that they weren't allowed to eat from. But when Eve responds, she too exaggerates. She says, oh, no, no, we're, we're allowed to eat of any of the trees in the garden. It's just not this one, the one that's in the middle. In fact, we're not allowed to even touch it. Now, God never said that. He just said, don't eat it. We read it before. And so Eve, she too exaggerates the truth, but just on the other end of the spectrum. But you know what? There's something even deeper hidden here in this story of Adam and Eve. And I would like to propose that this right here is actually the original story Romeo and Juliet. In fact, I reckon it is the story of Adam and Eve. That's where William Shakespeare got his inspiration to write the great tragedy, Romeo and Juliet. Now, chances are 
most of you know what this story is all about. But for those of you who are less familiar, let me quickly explain. Romeo and Juliet are starstruck lovers, young teenagers who've fallen in love with each other, um, but they come from rival families, and so they are not allowed to be wed. And so the priest hatches a plan. Look, if I give you this potion, Eve, it's a potion that will make you look like you have died and then we'll mourn your death and then you can sneak off and when you recover or wake up from your deep slumber you'll be able to be wed and live happily ever after. Great plan, only problem is someone forgot to let the fellow in on the plan. Like Romeo had no idea that this was happening and so he just one day came along and discovered that Eve uh, sorry, Eve, uh, Juliet, had taken the potion and, and now she was dead. He thought she'd drunk poison. And so he's like, I can't live if living is without you. And so he takes the real poison and kills himself. Juliet wakes up just as he's dying and he's like, what, 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 you're not like really dead, but now he really does die and she too sings the next verse, the chorus, I can't live if living is without you, and so she too kills herself. That's why it's called a great tragedy, because how tragic. But when you think about it, this right here is the story of Adam and Eve. Eve partakes of the fruit that God says, when you do, you'll die. And in that moment, she becomes mortal. Remember God said, in the day that you do it, that'll be the day that you die. So she is ineffectively, uh, in effect, gone from being immortal to being mortal. She has now started the death and decay process. Her, her life would wind down. But now Adam is presented with a terrible choice as he's like, Eve, you're mortal. And so Eve is like, well, you could join me and hands him the fruit. Now, he's presented with this choice to either stay in everlasting, immortal relationship with God or to, in essence, kill himself and join Eve in her mortality. What a terrible choice. Of course, immediately after this takes place, God comes walking in the cool of the evening and says, hey, like, where are you guys? And they're hiding behind a tree and they're like, over here. And God's like, why, why are you hiding behind a tree? And they say, well, because we're naked and we were ashamed. Now, all of a sudden, they know what naked is. And now they know what shame is because their eyes have been opened to a brand new reality. It's interesting because that's exactly what happens in our lives too. When we make poor choices or poor decisions, we too enter into this experience of shame. Now, when I was with you last, we actually spoke about shame. We talked about the difference between guilt and shame. Guilt being you feel bad for what you've done, but shame is where you feel bad for who it is that you've become and who you become as often as a result of repeat offense, keeping on doing the thing that you know that you shouldn't do. And neurologically speaking, if we don't actually deal with our shame, well, it leads to brain changes in the basal ganglia of our brain. I know, like, when was the last time the term basal ganglia was used in church? But let me unpack it for you really quickly. It sounds like a complicated term, but all that it really means is basal at the base of our brain is a cluster of cells, a ganglia. And these cells are important, or this part of the brain is important because this is where habits get locked in. With our self-worth in freefall feeling bad for who it is that we have become because of poor choices, sometimes we can beat ourselves up. But feeling bad is horrible, so we often reach for some kind of tonic to make us feel good. And it doesn't matter if it's the euphoria of sexual engagement or the high of drug use or even the, the, the ongoing drama of conflict in the home. Well, it all starts to become a vice for us after a while. We spoke about this when I was last with you. Even alcohol is just liquid love. It's a tonic that we apply to try and drown out the shame. It's a little bit like that song, 
by Sia called Chandelier as she sings Keep My Glass Full Until Morning Light. You know this song, right? Cause I'm just holding on for tonight, on for tonight. Sun is up, I'm a mess, gotta get out now, gotta run from this. Here comes the shame, here comes the shame. One, two, three, one, two, three, drink. The song ends by singing, throw them back until I lose count. Toxic shame is almost always synonymous with addiction. Repeat behavior, repeat offense, doing the thing that we don't want to do. When I was with you last, we spoke about this girl called Rahab. I don't know if you, any of you remember, um, but if anyone would have been a candidate for shame, I reckon Rahab would have been a great candidate because she was living as a prostitute on the outskirts of the town, uh, being whispered about, being gossiped about, if you will. So A, she was marginalised, living on the city wall. You can't get further away from the centre of town than that. And the neighbours would have been talking about her. And we know this to be true because one day, two spies came into the Israeli camp. And of course, the neighbours went to the officials and said, look, there are two Israeli spies. They're, they're in with Rahab. And so, of course, the city officials come knocking on Rahab's door and say, give up these two spies. But to give this story a little bit of context, 40 years earlier, Moses sent in 12 spies to spy out the land. And 10 of them came back with a bad news report. And only two came back with a good news report. Of course, you know it was Joshua and Caleb. Well, four decades on, Joshua is now at the helm. He's in charge of the nation of Israel, and he is not making that same mistake twice. So he doesn't send in 12 spies. He only sends in two spies to spy out the land. Now, of course, Scripture doesn't tell us what their names are, but I have it on good authority that it could well be that their names were Luther Stickle and Ethan Hunt from Mission Impossible. Because these two spies, they must have only just graduated from the Mossart spy school. They were useless at their job because they got identified on their very first mission. Where are the spies? Oh, they're in with Rahab. But there's a deeper meaning to this story. You see, Rahab understood that Jericho was doomed for destruction and the only way that she could be saved is if she entered into a covenant with Joshua before he came. Now, now you've got to get this. Uh, the word Joshua in Hebrew is pronounced Yeshua, or in Greek is pronounced Jesus. It's no coincidence that Joshua and Jesus don't just share the same name, they actually share the same role at this particular juncture of history, delivering God's people out of bondage and into a, a, a freedom or a promised land. And so in this particular context, she knew that she needed to enter into a covenant with Yeshua before his second coming. Because remember, this wasn't his first time, this was his second time. He was one of the original 12 spies that spied out the land. In the same way, Jesus, we are awaiting his second coming because he too was here once before with 12 others. I don't know if you get it, but there are some amazing parallels going on here. You see, in order for Rahab to overcome her shame, she needed to trust and in the same way, the only way that we get to be saved is if we enter into a covenant of our own with Yeshua before his second coming. As he says, then he wipes away all of the shame. The antidote to shame is called trust. But coming back quickly to Adam and Eve, it's interesting that, once again, they're having this casual conversation with the snake. But have you ever stopped to ask why the snake? What does the snake actually symbolize? Well, the Hebrew word for snake is nachesh. And nachesh is actually an interesting word. It's a rare word. It's a trinity word. It's a noun, a verb, and an adjective. This word nachesh means serpent, which is the noun. It also means to anoint, to hiss, whisper, or enchant, which is the verb. And of course, the adjective is that it's a bronze, bright, shining 
eternal one. Now, hang on, why eternal one? That's a, that's a little bit weird. Well, that's actually where we get the symbol of eternity, which is the ring. In ancient Greek, it would be the snake eating its tail called the Ouroboros. This is a, a, a symbol for eternity, but why eternity? It, got, it kind of got me, you know, wondering one day. And so I thought, I'm going to look up the, the numerical equivalent. Because in Hebrew, each letter, just like the Roman letters, uh, have a numerical equivalent. So the number five is the symbol V or the letter V. The number 10 is the X. Ones are ones. It, you get the point. And so I looked up the, uh, the numerical equivalent and discovered that the word Nachesh was made up of three numbers, 58 and 300, totaling 358. Do you know the symbolism of that? No, <laughs> me either. No idea. So what I thought I would do is just do another search for any other word that might share the same numerical equivalent, and I found one. Made up of four letters, 40, 310, and 8, totaling 358, and it is the word Mashiach, the Messiah. I'm like, hang on just a second. Do -do 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 -do. This shouldn't be happening. Like, like, I could get it if the devil's number, the snake was 666, and Jesus' number was 777. That would fly really well with me. But hang on, what on earth is going on here? But if we don't understand, well, just read on. And it's interesting because when we look at the various different illustrations of snakes throughout scripture, we see that one of them actually points to Mashiach. The Israelites were in the wilderness complaining, whinging, whining, and griping about God. And God caused poisonous snakes to come out of the earth and bite the people. People were getting sick and dying. So they cried out to Moses. Moses like, do something. So Moses goes to God and says, help me out here. Like, what do I do? And God says, fashion a bronze brass shining snake and put it on a pole and lift it up for all to see and whoever looks at the snake shall not perish but have salvation in other words they won't die they'll be saved now that's kind of like weird don't you think like why a snake like if it was jesus on the cross and we all looked that that would make more sense but even jesus himself goes so far as to say in the same way that the snake was lifted up in the wilderness that whoever looked at the snake would be saved so too the son of man must be lifted up and whoever believes on him shall not perish but shall be saved like what is going on here this sounds sacrilegious what is Jesus calling himself the serpent or the snake what's going on here we'll check it out 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him, him being Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us. Jesus didn't just take the sin of the world on his shoulders. He became like the snake. Now, before you misunderstand, don't you know blog and say this is sacrilegious teaching and Dr. Robbie is saying that Jesus is the serpent. No, no, no. But Jesus, he invades every aspect of what is wrong and he makes it right. He undoes the plans of the enemy, what the enemy intends for evil. God can turn around and make it for good that even in the get-go, in the Garden of Eden, as the snake is talking to Eve, one of the names of the snake, Nachesh, is the eternal one. That God implants a solution into every problem and changes everything. It's interesting, final thought, that the snake is actually one of the only animals, if not the only animal, that sheds its skin and is reborn. We actually are the sinners. We're the snake. But when we trust in him, and trust is the antidote for shame, the good news is that we get to shed our old life the skin of, that's decaying and we get to enter into a brand new eternal relationship with him. I hope that you've been encouraged today. I know a little bit outside of the square. Hopefully it got you thinking. Hopefully it's made you more hungry to actually read the word and not just know what it says, but really seek to understand it. And if you're still confused, well, don't blog about it. Don't say he heresy, bad teaching. No, read on. Search more. Discover there's so much 
to be discovered in God's word. And not only that, but when we enter into a relationship with him, there too, we discover great riches. By wisdom, a house is built. Through understanding, its foundations are established. And with knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasure. God bless. Wow, what a brilliant word from Dr. Robbie. Every time he speaks, my mind just gets stretched. You know, the thought that he shared about Adam and Eve in the garden and how that they, who were immortal, gave up their immortality and became mortal because that's what sin does. Sin kills. The wages of sin is death. I think of how Jesus, lifted up, has come to offer back to Adam and Eve, their children and their offspring, immortality. Once they lost that, it was lost. But God provided a way that the mortal could become immortal again. And that, of course, is through the cross and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus came and lived among mortal men. And he died on the cross to take the sin that gave us our mortality, took it upon himself, died on the cross, rose from the dead, and now offers to every man and every woman eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish through their mortality, but have everlasting life. Are you in possession of everlasting life. Do you know that you who were born mortal are now immortal, that now you have eternal life? You can know that the moment you put your faith, your heart, your trust into the hands of the Lord Jesus. I'm going to invite you to do what I did many years ago, and that is ask Jesus to come into your heart. Ask Jesus to forgive you of all the sin, the sin that kills us, the sin that makes us mortal. And in one moment, with a prayer of faith, leaning in and apprehending Christ, we pass, the Bible says, from death unto life. If you've not made that great passage, make it right now. Pray with me this prayer. I'll I'll lead us, and you pray it right where you are, right where you're listening right now. Dear God, I'm a sinner, 
And in many ways, I'm a dead man, a dead person. It's just a matter of time. But Jesus, you came. And on the cross, you took away all the sin of the world. And now I receive the great gift of God, the mercy of God, the God who came to us and sought us that he might restore to us eternal life and immortality. And in this moment, I say, Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus, forgive all of my sins. I trust you. And I know that life is in you and in your Father. And so, Jesus, this day, become my Savior and become my eternal Lord. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer with me, welcome to forever. Welcome to a forever friendship and family relationship with God. No one earns it. We don't deserve it. It's God's pursual of us. It's his free gift to all human beings. Craig said earlier, you know, at the foot of the cross, we're all equal. We're all sinners. That's what we are. And now we have a new identity in Jesus Christ. How fantastic. Well, I just miss you, and we are looking forward to the time when we will all be back in-house. But until that time, I'm just speaking blessing over you. I'm just praying that you are healthy. And if you need ministry, if you need prayer, if there's anything we can do to serve you in any way, please contact us there. You'll see the details. And so I'm going to close us in prayer. And uh, this afternoon, we have Pastor Stuart McClement going to be preaching the word to us. And everybody in Sydney knows who Stewie is, and we love him. And I, I miss him speaking into my life. And so he'll be sharing this evening. So, Father, I just thank you for our church family. I thank you for friends that have joined us from around the world this morning. And I ask now, Lord, that we would take this encouraging, exciting word filled with all kinds of insight into our heart. And that, Lord, we will live this week. We will live big. We will live bold. We will live brave. And, Father, I also pray we will live in kindness. And I pray that we will live in love. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.